Man, he's giving you a lot of those notes. Yeah, I think it's cute. Love is patient. Love is kind. beautiful tiny ring I've ever seen. Love doesn't boast. It's not much. But it's ours. Welcome home. Love isn't proud. I'm sorry, there's no heartbeat. Love protects. Have to go. <laughs> Have a nice quiet day at work, hon. Love doesn't envy. Love isn't self-seeking. Love keeps no records of wrongs. Love always trusts and always hopes. Lord Jesus, I pray for uh, I pray for this few moments that we have here, God. I pray that uh, I pray that you would correct our hearts, that you'd help us to think about marriage and romance and singleness and all the things in between, not in a new way, but in a way that you you would have us think about it. Not to hold us back, not for a bunch of rules, but because you love us and you know a better way, you have a better way. And that way is 100% completely and utterly through you. Speak to us now, Lord Jesus. Everybody said, amen. All right. Um, 
I'm going to be down here one more time. I really felt like this was just another chance to have more of a conversation rather than being like upfront teaching, preaching, you know, that kind of thing. Um, every human, every one of us, every human is born with a desire to experience what you just saw up on the screen. A desire to experience that type of human connection, that type of love and commitment. We all want it. We all crave it. All of us. To kind of break this down and make it more clear, um, there's three things that I think we ultimately want and crave. Even you silly boys, who sometimes have a hard time paying attention more than three seconds. We still love you. It's okay. We all desire, number one, to be known. We all want to be known and understood, right? We want to be a part of something. We don't want to be alone. The second thing we want is to be accepted, to be thought of as good enough affirmed, valued. We don't want to be rejected. And lastly, and above all, we want to be loved. And we've talked a lot about that, and I'll just summarize it right now as being treasured, worth the highest price. You see, what each of us, one of our greatest desires is to know that we mean something to someone, and one of our greatest fears is to be known and rejected. One of our greatest desires is to be known by someone. That means the person in the world who knows you the best, the in, the out, everything in between. They know you're good. They know the bad. They know the ugly. They know the beautiful. They know it all. We want to be known, deeply seen, deeply understood, deeply valued. But the risk with being known, the risk with romance, is that in getting to know someone, in being known, that you could be rejected because of who you are. So our greatest desire, one of our greatest desires is, is to be known, to know that we mean something to someone. And as such, one of our greatest fears is to be known and rejected. And that is why romance is hard. Because if there's no marriage yet, there's no promise of marriage, the relationship will end in some form of rejection. That's why it's hard. You're with someone, and you're hopeful, and you're like, this is great, it's awesome, but then something changes, and one of you or both of you agree that this isn't right. You were known and ultimately rejected. That is the risk of love. But you cannot experience a relationship that ultimately leads to marriage without taking that risk. So how do we do it? How do we get that? Many of us, when we see a story like that on the screen, we want what we just saw for ourselves. The connection, the commitment, the romance, the lifelong friendship. There's even, even for some of us guys who are like too young to be okay with our emotions, we watch that and we're like, yeah, that's kind of cute. Like, yeah, that's kind of cute. The way they're laughing at the end, he put his hand on her. It's kind of cute. I've honestly been showing that video at this church for 10 years now in this sermon, and I haven't stopped. Part of the reason I haven't stopped because um, what you just saw is beautiful. What you just saw is, is wonderful. Tonight, I want to talk briefly about two of the ways that God has lovingly provided the space for each of us to be known, ex ex accepted, and loved. There are more than these two options, these two spaces. Um, for example, friendship is actually a place to be known, accepted, and loved. Deep friends um, can fill a relational part of your heart and, and be completely platonic. I'm not giving you an exhaustive list, meaning that the two things I'm going to give you are not the only things that can provide love and friendship, or, or love, acceptance, and to be known. But these are two of the ones that I think uniquely uh, apply to us here tonight when this conversation about marriage. So I'm going to start with the first one. The first of the two things that God has given us lovingly so that we can be known, accepted, and loved is marriage, what you just saw on the screen. And what you just saw was the end of the life of two people 
who have very dearly known, very dearly loved and accepted each other and have lived in an adventure of life together. They're looking through their memories, having all these memories, and they're still together, still laughing together. They will, they will likely experience till death d- does them part which is both a beautiful thing and a tragic thing. And the reason I show that to you is I want you to see that marriage done right is a gift. It is. It's beautiful. It's a gift from God designed to provide us with our deepest relational desires and hold at bay our deepest fears. If our deepest desires is to be known and accepted and loved, and our deepest fears is to be known and rejected, then marriage, in many ways, is supposed to, is designed to, in a way provide us our greatest desire, and hold at bay our greatest fears. In this November, for 20 years, Ginger has been holding at bay my greatest fears and providing me the type of relationship of being known, loved, and accepted. And we've grown closer and closer every day since. Unfortunately, many of you, when you think of marriage, you think of it through the lens of your own personal experience, and not everyone in this room has seen a great experience, seen a great example of marriage. Maybe you're sitting here right now and you're looking at that marriage on the screen and you're going, that's not what I've seen in my parents. Maybe for seasons, maybe never for seasons. And so for you, your experience, many of you, has been divorce, cheating, loud arguments, distrust, pain, yelling, and tears. And the example that you've been given of marriage maybe doesn't give you much hope. It may even make you feel a little bit cynical about marriage, which is understandable. If that's you here tonight, I want you to know that it's okay to feel how you feel about marriage. But I want you to take the experience that you have seen, and I want you just to not throw it away, not get rid of it, but just set it aside for a second and give me 15 more minutes to have your attention and see if we can't change things up a little bit for you. Tonight, I want to tell you the truth. The truth is that God's plan for marriage is completely and utterly wonderful and absolutely worth the wait. I want you to hear that again. God's plan for marriage is completely and utterly wonderful and absolutely worth the wait. What many of us are doing with love, sex, and dating unfortunately, is trying to take the good of marriage and experience it now without waiting for what marriage is. Our hearts long so deeply to be known, accepted, and loved that we want it now. I don't feel known. I don't feel loved. I don't feel accepted. And I'm looking for anyone who will make me feel that way. And I get that. Please don't hear shade. My job, my hope right now is not to condemn you or make you feel shame. I'm just simply trying to tell you the truth about where you're at. You ever heard the J.G. Wentworth commercial? It's my money and I want it now. That's what we do with love. We actually skip love. We skip being known. We skip being accepted. And we give parts of ourselves to people we barely know. I get it. So let me try and explain why maybe from this day forward it would be better for you to wait. Marriage should mean that you've found someone who knows you on the inside and out, yet despite all they discover, they fall deeply in love with you and promise to never leave you unless death, until death does you part. That's what marriage is. That's the beauty of marriage. It's I know you and I want you. But instead, we give our hearts to, and sometimes our bodies to someone who hardly knows us at all, and then it leaves us feeling empty. Because what we really wanted all along was someone to treasure us, to effectively say, I choose you over everyone else in the world. And I'll prove it with a promise until we die. Marriage is supposed to be built upon sacrifice. A daily giving of oneself for the, for the well-being and the benefit of the spouse. Just like the sacrificial love that Jesus showed us in his life, in his death, in his resurrection. And as such, that kind of love, sacrificial love, 
it's hard to do on your own. It's, it's really hard to produce that type of Christ-like godly love on your own. We've talked about this. It's really too powerful to develop by ourselves. It has to be taught by God. God has to teach you a lot about yourself before you can accept the kind of love that God has for you in a spouse that loves him first. God has to teach you a lot about yourself and about love before you can accept the kind of love that God has for you in a spouse that puts him first and loves him first. So my hope for you is no matter where you're at right now, as we're talking about marriage, whatever your view was on marriage, whatever your thought was on whether I'm going to get married or not, whatever your space is, how, however, much of yourself, however much you've waited for marriage, however much you haven't waited for marriage, you're all in the same boat for me. Here's what I want to say. The beautiful part about the gospel is that whatever we've done in the past, there's hope for the future. I don't, the, the gospel doesn't take the time to look at what you've done because it's too focused on the power that God has over what you've done. And if you're listening to me right now and you're going, man, this marriage stuff sounds really cool, but I've kind of, I've kind of not, not, not I, I've kind of spent some of those chips. I've kind of gone into the space of marriage with people that I hardly knew, and, and, and it just kind of feels like I've missed out. Listen, you can't change what you've done. But you can change your mind and your direction today. And let's say that in, by the end of this, you're going, man, I really want to live. I want to do it God's way. I, I want to I live in such a way that I'm, I'm going to, to, to save myself, as they used to say, for marriage. I'm just going to do my best with that, right? From this day forward, great. If you're interested right now in how to experience that type of marriage, no matter your past, let me give you three quick pieces of advice, and then I'm going to tell you the other way that God provides a means for us to be known, accepted, and loved. How do I get that kind of marriage? Number one, cling to God. You need him before marriage. You need him during marriage. And if you seek him, you're going to find him, and he will mold you into the person that you need to be. Here's the thing. It takes humility, love, and patience to be a good spouse. And those are not things we produce well on our own. On our own. We kind of suck at those. The beautiful part about knowing God is he'll teach you humility. He'll teach you how to love. He'll teach you how to be loved. He'll teach you how to be known and accepted. You want to experience the type of marriage that you saw up on the screen. Number one, cling to God. And honestly, I could end right here. The other ones matter far less than this one. I counted. Since I became a pastor, I've now done 30 weddings. 30. It's a lot. Maybe it doesn't seem like a lot to you. It's a lot to me. They don't all end well. And as Ginger and I have sat with couples that we've done marriage count, pre, pre-marriage counseling with, marriage counseling with, and all of the above, um, do you know what the number one cause of divorce is? A lack of pursuit of God. Because in order to be a good spouse, you have to love humbly, and you have to respect your spouse, you have to put them first. Those are hard. Do you understand that even though Ginger and I have been married for 20 years, there are days where I literally have to go, I'm going to put her first. Not because I feel all oogly and googly in love with her. Some days I do. Some days I don't. But because I promised. Because God, through his spirit, works in me and gives me the strength to do things that I'm not even capable of my, on my own. In almost every marriage counseling scenario that I've ever been in, when I sit down with a couple and I listen to them tell me their problems, it always comes down to the lack of love, the lack of respect, and a lack of humility, all of which are the things that God teaches us in a relationship with him. And any time I counsel a couple and they step and they go out, and the advice is very simple, and I know this sounds like, like it's too good to be true. The advice is very simple. If you leave this place, and you go and you pursue God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. You put him first in your life. You put him above your wife. You put him above your kids. You put him above your husband. You put him above your kids. 
When you come back to this space in two weeks when we meet again, you will be a different person and you will be better at being married. It is that real. If you want what you just saw on the screen, cling to Jesus. Hold on to him like he's a rope that's keeping you from falling off a cliff and never let go because that is actually what's happening. You want that kind of marriage, number two, practice commitment. The way that we're dating today does not teach us how to stay married. It teaches us how to divorce. You got to put others above yourself. And for some of you, that means protecting people from the version of you that exists right now. You could date. Why not? I'm sure there's people who'd go out with you. But what if you cared about other people more than yourself and you looked in the mirror and you're like, I don't know that I'm ready to care for a person. And you almost protected them from you. We gotta stop entering these exclusive dating relationships with people we hardly know. Can I just tell you something very practical? Some of you are dating all the time with people you hardly know and you're exclusive with them. Meaning you're, you expect them to date no one else, and you expect, you know what I'm saying. You expect that. Why would you do that with someone you don't know? Are you in the habit of getting in cars with people you don't know? In the habit of just giving your bank account number to people? Like, there's a, there's a sense in which you don't trust until someone has proven to be trustworthy, and your generation is super quick to get, to say yes to someone asking you out. And you don't know them. Stop getting in all these exclusive relationships with people you hardly know. Start getting to know people before you date them. Someone asks you out, no. But we could be friends. Let's start there. Sorry, no thanks. Obviously, they're not worth your time then. You want to know if someone's worth your time? Tell them no and say, let's be friends. If they stick around, it might be something there. Stop dating so that you can stop breaking up. Start focusing on becoming the kind of person you need to be in Jesus before you worry about some sort of exclusive romance. You don't need it. And lastly, wait. Wait, wait, wait. I know this is going to sound kind of weird and strange, but you could totally do it too. It honestly wasn't hard. I didn't date a single human being in my entire life before I met Ginger. Not one. Not a single person. More on that later. Surround yourself with the people who will help you. If you're in a relationship with someone, you got to surround yourself with, with friends who know the Lord and love the Lord and will hold you accountable because being in a relationship is hard. Because the Bible expects that sex is safe for marriage. We talked about that last week. But sex is the very thing you want to do when you're with someone you love. So if you really want to do it God's way, you got to get an accountability in a relationship. And some of you need to be in accountability in a relationship for dating. It's not even about purity. You're like, no, I need you to protect me from dating, period. Don't let me do it, no matter how hard I cry. <laughs> like, some of y'all just need a dating sabbatical or a break. Like, just take a year off. It'll be the best year of your life, I promise. Okay, two ways that God has lovingly provided the space for each of us to be known, accepted, and loved. Number one, marriage. Number two, and this makes it all pretty with a bow, is singleness. I'm going to surprise some of you with this, and it might actually frustrate you, but I need you to hear me. What if I told you the best way to prepare for marriage was to stay single? You ever thought of that? What if I told you that being single was necessary to have the deepest relationship with God possible? Can I tell you a secret? And I'm not thinking names or anything like that, but can I just tell you an honest to God secret? Those of you in this room who don't date are the most mature Christians in our youth group. Almost every time. Not always, but almost every time. 
And those of you who want to grow closer to God, you know what you often need? To be alone. You know why? Because when you love someone in a space where you're not ready to love them, they become your God. You give them that space. They can have all of you, all of your attention, all of your time, and you won't have any left for God. If you want to know God, if you want to be used for God, if, if there's any of you in this room that what I'm about to say, these are desires of yours. If you want to know God, if you're in this room and you want to know God, if you're in this room and you want to be used by God, if you're in this room and you want to rely on God, if you're in this room and you want to develop intimacy with God, remain single. Look at 1 Corinthians 7, 7 through 9. Check this out. Paul says this. This is the Apostle Paul, who is a single dude, by the way. He says, I wish that all of you were as I am. He's actually talking about being single. But each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. And then he says to the unmarried people, all of the widows, it's good for you to stay unmarried as I am. But if you can't control yourselves, you should marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with passion. What he's saying is very simple. Singleness requires... What he's saying is very simple. There are those of us who are actually able, we're actually able to remain single. We don't have this like super strong desire in our hearts to be in love and it's, that's just who you are and that's okay. I, sometimes I think we get, it's just kind of weird. It's not weird. You're like the Apostle Paul. You have a gift. That's literally what he's saying. It's a gift. And the reason it's a gift is because those of us who are single, we're not attached and tied down to a spouse or family, and we can do some incredible things for the kingdom of God. I'm not that kind of person. Marriage was important for me, and I needed it. I don't have that gift. But I'm going to be honest with you. If I did, I would be way more available to all of you than I am right now. I'd be, I'd be almost, you could just call me any time, day or night. I wouldn't have a wife or kids that, that I love and, and need and want to spend time with and crave spending. I wouldn't have that. I'd just be able to come. Anytime you needed me, shoot me a call. You can come on over. Singleness requires us to be fully reliant on God to be known, loved, and accepted. When we're single, we can't rely on a human to know us with such intimacy that God can to Paul, not only is singleness a calling, like some of, some of us are called to remain single. I know some of those people, and they're incredible human beings, some of my favorite in the world. Some of us are called, and some of us just have a gift. We don't need it. We don't need marriage. For those of us who are never single, how do you learn to rely on God? How do you learn to rely on the King of Kings and Lord of Lords if you're always devoting all of your attention to someone else? How? Love is intimate. It takes time. How do we prepare ourselves for a unique, committed love in marriage if we're never single so that we can learn how to rely on God's love first? Let me close with this. Earlier tonight, I said God's plan for marriage is completely wonderful and absolutely worth the wait. And part of the reason that we have struggled so deeply to follow God's plan for marriage is because we've assumed that the only way to feel known, accepted, and loved is in human romance. And we are wrong. We impatient, impatiently chase this acceptance, this love, and this romance, so much so that we prevent ourselves from ever really experiencing it. You know how many times I've seen men and women so devoted to be in a dating relationship, they never actually learned how to love. And so they got married, and what they had was not love. And so their marriage didn't survive. The way to experience the deepest desires of your heart to be known and loved and accepted is in Jesus and Jesus alone. And if we would simply learn to pursue his love first and foremost, then our hearts would be fully satisfied in him. And satisfied hearts make the best husbands, best wives, best friends, best moms, best dads, best coworkers, best sisters, best brothers, etc., It turns out that the best version of you is found in an intimate, loving relationship with Jesus. 
turns out that the best version of you is found in an intimate and loving relationship with Jesus. So is that what you've been pursuing? I've been a youth pastor for 22 years now. And the message I'm sharing with you right now is the first time I've ever preached it. I've never taught like this on single men. Because I didn't quite understand it yet. In the last year, maybe two years, I'll say, um, through some pretty unique kind of divine moments, it's all God, it's not me. God has taught me about singleness in a way that I'd never thought about it before. People in my life who I'm watching live newly single lives or, or, look, or talking to people whose trajectory is to be single their whole lives and, and, and watching them and, and realizing that these are some of the most respectful uh, people that I've ever met. There is a power in singleness that I've never recognized until this year. A power that's robbed from us when we're so quick to put another boo under our arm. I'm sharing with you this message for the first time quite simply because it's the first time I've realized it, but I'm also going to say this. I think this is the best marriage sermon I've ever written. I want you to understand that you are an incredible human being. Psalm 139, knit together in your mother's womb, in the darkness, the Spirit of God was there with you, forming you and planning all the days of your lives. You are incredible, and you don't need anyone. You don't need anyone. You need him. And if all of us simply understood that, if all of us just kind of figured that out and kind of cracked that code, we realized that as much as there's cute girls and cute guys and as much as the pheromones and all the hormones and all the stuff that just makes me want a boyfriend or girlfriend all the time, I get it, it's there. I understand it. I was there once too. But I was also a teenager who rejected all of it and waited on the Lord. And I'll tell you this, I look at all of you and the drama you got in your lives dating, I don't regret being single for a second. I waited and waited and waited, and then she asked me out. Yeah, you can clap at that, it's kind of impressive. <laughs> just kidding. Listen, tonight I just introduced you in a new way of thinking. And I encourage you to test it. I encourage you to ask questions about it. I encourage you to pray on it. I encourage you to seek the Lord on it. I encourage you to talk in your small groups about it. I encourage you who are single to remain single. Please. And I encourage those of you who are in a relationship, make that relationship about him, not each other. Or I promise you'll break each other's hearts. If you're not with someone whom you can put Jesus first with, you're with the wrong person. They will rob you of joy. They will rob you of value. They have no capability inside of them to love you the way that you need to be loved, the way that you deserve to be loved. And who knows, maybe some of you, if those of you who are single and you just remain that way, maybe you'll just find this new joy in life because you're free from the need or the desire to be attached by a ball and chain to someone because everyone else is. Or maybe, like me, someday you'll go to work at a Dairy Queen and the girl next door at Zales Jewelry thinks you're hot. Comes over every day and gets her raspberry Mr. Misty float, starts flirting with you, and you're like, I don't know why she'd want to date me. I go home with ice cream on my shirt every night. And then 23 years later, you're married. 20 years. Stop looking for a human 
Start looking for your King Jesus. Let me pray. God, thank you for this chat. I pray for our time in our groups right now, Lord. Would you help us to process and think through this? Lord, for those who are already in a relationship right now, I pray you give them the wisdom and the, the desire and the hunger to make their relationship about you. And in doing so, guard each other from the worst parts of themselves. I pray for those of us who are single. I pray that you would um, put a new desire in our heart to, to, to know that and, and experience that for a while. Give us the freedom of being single. Give us the freedom of being able to know you and, and sit with you and talk with you and, and not be distracted by anyone else, Lord, and build in us a deep knowledge and love for you, God, because we're not distracted. Because, Lord, whether we end up married or single or, or anything, God, what my hope and prayer for each of us is that if whatever is true, the one thing that, that would be true about each of us is that we are hopelessly and deeply in love with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's go to groups.